afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the National Museum of American History and to our Ask a Farmer program today on the Wallace H. Coulter Performance Plaza. My name is Susan Evans McClure. I'm the program director of our Smithsonian Food History programs here at the museum. Hi, guys. Come on over. Well, you can join us, plenty of space. Um, and here at the museum, we explore American history through what we eat, what we cook, and how it's grown through programs year-round in the museum. And we're thrilled today to have an amazing panel with us um, to talk about the very big topic of women in agriculture. And we hope you as our audience will join the conversation. We'll be taking lots of questions today. Uh, it is called Ask a Farmer, so you'll be doing the asking. Um, and, but we also hope you'll join the conversation online using the hashtag Smithsonian Food. This is the first of a mini series we're doing here of three panels over the next few months. So we hope that you'll come back over your lunch break uh, next month and in September. We'll be talking about multi-generational family farms uh, in August, on August 5th. And then on September 16th, we'll be discussing Latinos in American agricultural history. I especially want to thank our supporters who are making this series possible, the US Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, and a special thanks to our um, supporters, John Deere, for making agricultural programming possible at the museum. And now, on to our panelists for today. Val Wagner to my left, I have you guys listed out of order. Um, is a North Dakota farmer and mother of four boys who grows corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, and raises beef cattle on her family farm. Rachel Gray, to my left, her left, is um, a Minnesota farmer born and raised on a dairy farm. Rachel is the mother of two boys and she taught school for 15 years before transitioning to ownership of her family's cow-calf Black Angus operation. Vanessa Kummer is a North Dakota farmer with over 35 years of farming experience. Um, with the help of her husband, Paul, and her son, Blaine, the family for farms soybeans, corn, wheat, and sugar beets. And Vanessa was also the first woman to chair the United Soybean Board in 2012, in the history of the United Soybean Board. Um, and to her left is Morgan Kuntz, who is a South Dakota farmer who earned a degree in agricultural education, but as she will tell us, never actually lived or worked on a farm until she met her husband and now lives a farm life. Together with her family, they farm 3,000 acres of corn, soybeans, and alfalfa, and manage a cow-calf herd and beef feedlot. So we have some very accomplished people here with very different backgrounds who are all working in agriculture today. So Rachel, I'm actually going to ask you to start us off. Can you just tell us about your farm and your role on the farm? Sure. Um, just keep talking and okay. there we go. Uh, I grew up on our farm. My great-grandfather started our farm and uh, made a transition. I decided to stop teaching and move back to the farm. And then eventually that transitioned into taking over and completely buying out my mom and dad. So I'm the sole owner right now. Um, my husband works overseas, so he's not a farmer and doesn't um, kind of have anything to do with the farming that way. He supports it. Uh, we still have 15 people that live on our farm. So me being the, the owner and the manager of that farm, I'm in different ways responsible for all of those 15 people, including my three great aunts that are in their 90s and love that they live in their own home, but it takes a lot to care for them also. So that's kind of our picture. Um, we have, like I said, 3,000 acres, and we run about 300 head of beef cattle, so it's a cow-calf operation. So it does, it does take a lot of help. There are 15 people that live there, but five of us work there full-time. Great. So then, Val, what is, um, on your farm, what is your role, and is it different, or how is it different than Rachel's experience? On our farm, well, I grew up on a farm. Um, thought I was going to move away from the farm, wasn't interested in rural life. Uh, moved away for a little while and decided that definitely wasn't a fit for me. So came back, met my husband. We have four boys, um, ages 14 to 7. And so my role has really evolved over the last few years, um, from you know, caretaking, raising young kids, to kind of fitting in wherever, uh, whatever is needed on the farm, whether it be driving truck or um, running a combine or just driving the tractor. Uh, kind of fitting in, filling in those blanks. So um, on our farm, we raise cattle uh, and as well as crops. And so 
my role right now has been like the night checks when we're calving, when, when the cows are having Can you explain calves. what a night check is? A night check is, since we're, I'm from North Dakota, um, we calve in February, which the temperatures is usually Calving below. means? Calving, having a cow. The cow is having a calf. So when they're having their babies, it's usually in February when it's really cold outside. Uh, we're talking minus 20, you know, wind chills that are really, really cold. So when a calf is born, it's wet. And so we try to have all of our cows have their babies in the barn so that it can stay dry and that they don't get chilled or too cold. And so we have to check the cows, which means walking through them and seeing which ones look like they're possibly going to be having a calf. Um, to make sure that they have their calves inside instead of outside, um, because a wet calf that gets, you know, it can it can kill a calf if it gets too cold. So that's kind of my responsibility during those months. Is um, we go out every two hours and walk through them and check and see if anybody's showing any signs of. You look for things like um, whether or not the cow is restless, different things like that. So that's Great. kind of my job. <laughs> Now, um, Vanessa, you have been in farming for 35 years, and um, can you talk about what your role is on the farm and how you've seen your role changing um, as a woman working in agriculture in your career? Well, it's actually been almost 38, 39 years now because I basically started farming when I got married. Um, working in town just wasn't that great of a paying job, and plus I wanted to be around the farm and be actually a part of the physical activity of the farm every day. So from the very beginning, I have done a lot of planting of the crops. So um, that has evolved to a wonderfully less heavy lifting type of a job to more of a sitting in a tractor and pushing buttons type of a job. When I first started, I had to load things by myself and they would be like either 50, 60 pound um, bags of corn or soybeans and you would take them and you'd dump them in each individual row of your planter. Well now I back the planter up, somebody on the ground puts the uh, auger in and they auger my seed right into my planter. So that's definitely gotten better. And um, we have global positioning satellite technology so when I get to a field and get everything opened up, I make my turn, I push a couple of buttons to make sure that the planter has gone down and that the um, driving, the steering part is taking over and then I keep my hands off the steering wheel and follow the line exactly as I have up and down the field all day long. So, and we have the same technology when I'm combining um, soybeans and which makes it very nice. Um, when you're combining soybeans, you have a 35 foot header out in front of you and you're trying to watch both edges of it to make sure you're not skipping or that you're not you know, going over 10, 15 feet of what you've already combined. And Can you explain what combining means? Combining that word? is our way of harvesting. Um, in the old days, it was thrashing. Um, but a combine is a self-propelled machine that brings the crop into the front and ends up with the seed in the um, tank of the combine. And the rest of it, the grass, the, or the, you know, the leaf material, the stalk material, all gets chewed up and just shot out the back end and gets scattered over the field again so that it's organic material for the next year. And um, so it's, it's our way of harvesting our crops and bringing in just the seeds. Great, now Morgan, you also did not grow up on a farm, um, but now you live on a farm and have a farm life. So can you talk about what your role is on, sure. on your family farm? Yeah, I have a pretty different background from the other three panelists since I, did not grow up on a farm, did not grow up in agriculture in any way other than 4-H and FFA, which are both youth organizations. And I had the opportunities there to show animals and be a part of you know, a little bit of agriculture. And I decided to go to college for agricultural education and my family was like, I don't even know where you got that from. Like, you're not, you know, you don't, you, we don't do any of that. So it was kind of a shock to them, but um, when I married my husband, I moved to South Dakota, and we farm now um, as a family. There are um, eight of us, so eight adults, I should say, and nine children. So um, we farm corn and soybeans and alfalfa, and then we um, finish beef cattle. We also breed them. We have babies, and then we 
um, we feed them through the whole process from the time they're born until um, until the time that they're processed. And through the years, my role on the farm has changed. And I think it's a lot like maybe all of you, we all go through seasons of life. And whether we have young children, older children, new jobs, and that's a lot of what my life is right now. I have two small children um, and I, they're four and 16 months. So I'm in a whole new you know, season of life. Um, and right now I am playing the mom card a lot more than I used to play the farmer card. And before we had kids, I was there every day with my husband working alongside him, whether it was driving trucks, helping in the field, or even something as simple as preparing meals. And now I still do a lot of those things, but my kids get to come along too, and it takes me about three times as long. <laughs> So it sounds like some of the roles you're talking about are, you know, you're you're the ones out there driving the tractors, working the combines. Do you think in your experiences, uh, have you experienced personally um, any kind of gender gap at being a woman working in agriculture? Vanessa, I see you chuckling over there. <laughs> um, there is definitely a gap as far as perception uh, is probably one of the worst things. Um, when it comes to me, if I want to go to the dealer and buy something or if I want to talk to the seed dealers, there's not really a gap there, but um, especially when I first was on the farm, we had different times when, uh, for one example, I was planting corn behind our yard and this pickup is following me down the field and I'm thinking, okay, I don't know why this pickup is following in my field, but when I got to the end, I got out and the gentleman got out of his pickup and he said, well, I'm from the local dealership and I need to find your husband because I want to get a check for the piece of equipment you bought last week. And I said, well, my husband is 15 miles south in a different field. Because he really didn't ask me for anything, right? He asked me where my husband was. Well, I'm the one who writes the checks on our farm. So he and drove that's down. What they forget. Yes, yeah, they do. do. We yes. do a lot of the check writing. We right. might do a lot of the buying, but we do a lot of the paying. <laughs> so he drove down and talked to my husband, and my husband looked at him like he was an idiot, and he said, um, Vanessa writes all the checks, so <laughs> if you ever want to get paid for anything on this farm, you better be talking to her, not me. And so it, it takes a little bit of um, teaching other people about what you do and how your operation works. We had to go through this with different bankers, um, you know, where I would call in and I would say we need this and that, and they would say, well, what does Paul want? Well, Paul wants me to take care of this business because he's overdoing something else. So we need to make sure that you understand that I am the person that can call in and take care of these things. Um, and there's one more example that is even more devastating, really, and that was the government. Um, when it came to the ASCS, is what it was called back then, the Agricultural Stabilization Service, um, they actually sent me a letter one time that said I was not a person. And being a person under the farm, um, farm Bill laws meant that you were a person that was active in the farm and that if there were anything like crop payments or something that were due to you under the Farm Bill, that you were a person that could participate. Well, at that time, if you were a woman, unless you had a separate line of credit, a separate field, separate line of machinery, everything completely separate from your husband, you couldn't be a person. And so um, my brother-in-law could be a person, even if he had nothing, but I couldn't be. So I did finally get a letter. I am now a person. At the age of 50, I turned into a person. I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> and, yeah, go ahead. I think uh, in, in kind of going with that, um, when I was First of all, I was very blessed because I grew up in a family that we were farming. And my grandmother farmed in the field. She was on the tractor. My mother was on the tractor. Um, and my dad was amazing at always encouraging myself and saying, you can do anything you want to do. If you want to drive that tractor, you go ahead. And so I started at eight years old raking hay. And always, I was always in the field. Um, and never knew that there was an issue with it. Mm -hmm. And when I went to do the transition and buy my mom and dad's farm, I went to get a loan. And many people don't realize it because of what Vanessa went through with her paperwork, they've now changed that. Except that as a woman farmer, I'm considered socially disadvantaged. 
And so when you sign those papers, you sign as a socially disadvantaged person. So how does that work for you? Like, on the, is there like a box you have to check? Is that there on is. the forms? <laughs> There okay. is a box that you that you check on those forms and you say, and it's all due to your gender. Um, we have that because of what Vanessa went through. And when I was talking about coming here, I said to my mom, I'm not sure why they worry about if I'm a woman or not, because to me, I'm just a farmer. I've always been a farmer. And she said, that's because years ago, she said, I couldn't sign the papers. I couldn't get the payment. I couldn't go to the bank. And she said, enough of us have come forward and said, we are farmers too. And, and she said, you need to go and you need to talk about that because it is an issue. Yeah. I think sometimes too that um, as women on the farm, especially like my mother, uh, my grandmother, a lot of times they downplayed their role on the farm, whether it be supplying a meal, taking care of the children, um, arranging for vehicles to get from point A to point B, um, or if it's being in the farmyard, being down in the barn with the cattle or anything like that, a lot of times they just downplayed their role because they didn't see themselves as the head of the household. They didn't see themselves as the face of the farm. And now we're able to um, actually stand up and say, look, you know, I'm just, my role is just as important. It may be different, but it's the same as w without what we do, the farm wouldn't exist either. Mm -hmm. Great. So how do you see this continuing to change in the future as new generations move into farming? How do you think the role of women will continue to change? I think, I think it's changed because um, I see more young girls wanting to come into agriculture and maybe not production agriculture. Um, it might be they become ag teachers or they see it as another viable avenue to a science degree. You know, maybe they work for a, an ag company that need, needs a scientist or things like that. But more than that, I see the change in my sons. Um, my kids have no idea that there's not, that, that there was a time period when a woman wouldn't identify as a farmer. Um, to them, it's just completely the way it, the way it is. It's very natural. Yeah. Um, so I see that change uh, maybe even as a generational gap more than mm -hmm. a gender gap. I would agree, generational gap, definitely. Just because I, um, I, I have really young children, so I'm, I come, I'm younger than these women up here. They have so much more experience than I do. Um, but when I went to college for the School of Agriculture, there were lots of girls. And I live in a generation now where there are so much more women and it's changed drastically from the time that we're worried about being socially disadvantaged to the time now where I am making decisions and my husband relies on the decisions that, that I make for, for our farm. I think one other thing is that the government is now getting more real about women and their activities on a farm. You know, it's, it's, it's like they've discovered that women are farming and so um, the numbers before were very low. I think the, the numbers that they will show as far as in the census of women who are farming and who are actively farming will grow just because they have now started to count us mm -hmm. differently. When we used to send in the census forms, you could only send in that one of you was the farmer. Well, you know, of course it's my husband, you know, it's a lot easier if I just sign everything like that. But, but the government is now saying, okay, we actually need to count who is out there on these farms, not just say that one person on the farm is what we're going to count. And like Val said, like it, I always tell, we have, you know, with nine kids between all our families, a lot of times some of the younger kids, oh, I don't want to do that job, that's the worst job ever. You know, there's not grunt work on a farm, there's a job that has to get done. And it doesn't matter how small or how big that job is, you might be in the combine one day calling all the shots, you might be the person that's preparing sandwiches for your family and for the hired help and making sure the kids get shuttled around. There's no, there's no small job, there's no grunt work, it's all work that has to get done no matter who does it, female or male. Mm -hmm. yeah. To me personally, one of the things looking to the future that I'm more concerned about as opposed to a gender gap is the generation gap. Yeah, Having new farmers come in, the younger people seeing their value on the farm and seeing what they can do um, and making agriculture their livelihood. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think that gender, whether or not you're male or female, is going to matter anymore. It's going to be, mm -hmm. do we have enough people out there actually physically doing the work mm -hmm. so that we can continue to support those people who are at the grocery store buying the, the products that we work to put on yeah. the table. And Absolutely. the statistics today are about 2% of the population is involved in agriculture in some way. Um, and th that percentage is on the closer side of 50s, 60s rather than 20s, 30s. Right. So. That's one thing I see on my farm is a labor issue. Mm -hmm. um, it is very hard to find someone to work yes. that will work the hours that I work, that will stay as long as I stay, and work as hard as and we do. And they're someone that's invested, invested in it as much as you are. And also someone that has the skill set. Um, I can find people that can drive heavy equipment mm -hmm. all day long, but it's finding someone that can care for cattle, drive heavy equipment, do the math, the science, everything else that I need, and I need that in one person that works relatively cheap. So how and, <laughs> and that's very hard. Yeah. So how would you solve that problem if you if you could make some changes? How what would you do to fix that? Um, most to be honest, most of our labor force comes from family and comes from expanding in directions that I can accommodate my own children if they choose to stay in right now they have. Um, and to make to be able to expand and to be um, visionary enough to expand our farm to accommodate multiple generations. And I think as a, as a farmer, that's what I see, is that I have to be sustainable enough to accommodate four to five generations beyond me. It also takes making sure that you put in programs in place on yes. your farm that teaches the um, what's needed to be done. because. When my son goes out and does the spring, he is, you know, it's very fast, it's very enclosed, and you need, you know, you he's got a trailer where everything is set up, and you're working with quarter of an ounce of chemical or an ounce of chemical, and then however many gallons of water, and you're mixing it all together within this trailer, and then a hose takes it out to the, the sprayer as it as it mixes. And so the person in there needs to understand about ounces and about gallons and about, you know, they need to be able to convert things for, for okay, one quarter of an ounce per acre and he can spray 200 acres with this load. How do I have to do that? And so it's, you know, having someone who has the capacity to do the math and then to be planning ahead enough so that once that sprayer is full and going off, he's not standing there smoking a cigarette relaxing, he's getting everything ready for the next batch because it doesn't take very long to get that 200 acres sprayed and then come back for a refill. Oh. Any, any solutions, Val? You look like you're going to share a solution. Well, uh, for me, especially, I have four young boys. And so um, automatically you start to think, next generation, how do I prepare? I want to make sure that their needs are met as far as if the farm is not something they want to do, that they have those opportunities as well. But I also want to make sure that if all four want to come back to farm, that we have room for them in mm -hmm. the operation to do so. Um, because hopefully they'll also bring families and, and different things like that. So you really have to look at how to, it's not about planting next year's crop, it's about planning for the future. It's, it's the same as, you know, we may be a farm, but we're still a business, just like any business that's on Main Street. So we have to make those preparations well mm -hmm. enough in advance so that there isn't the growing pain part of it where people um, don't know, like my sons won't know what their place is on the farm yeah. or, and to make sure that their, their desires and their niches are met. Like if, if one is more passionate about cattle, that they are able to come in and work with the herd. And, if one is more um, passionate about um, the mechanics of it all. Uh, it's not just blue collar work. There's a lot of numbers to it too. You need someone who's good with understanding finances and understanding um, marketing. And there's so many nuances. You know, a farmer just doesn't plant a crop. A farmer has so many hats that they wear now. Mm -hmm. um, that you just, you really have to be able to nurture that and, and help them discover their own way on the farm. Yeah. One thing that we've done um, and started a program with, having been a teacher, I kind of looked at the, at the labor force in general and I thought there's a lot of young kids in our town that maybe 
want a job. And they can't handle all the big jobs, but they can handle some smaller jobs on the farm. So I have three um, 14, 15 year old kids hired and they do small jobs. And it might be the gopher jobs. They're marking fence lines with um, wildlife markers or maybe they're mowing lawn or those kinds of things. And as they get better and as I kind of see, oh, this, this kid really likes to feed grain to the cattle. So I've kind of moved him into that. And they're there two days a week. And one boy already came to me and he said, I, I start football next week, but he said, can I work again next summer? And so kind of a training program for kids. Uh -huh. And we do an interview process and we have to talk to their parents and we do that. That really has helped with those smaller jobs that are hard to get done. Yeah. It's hard to mow five lawns. <laughs> Absolutely. <you know? laughs> Great, so um, we do want to make sure we leave enough time to turn it over to the audience. Um, Catherine, can you wave your hand? She is back there and has a microphone. So if anyone has a question, we would love to hear it and our panel would love to take a stab at answering it. So I think we have one right up front. Two right up front. Oh, hi, um, I got here a little bit late, so maybe you talked about all this before I sat down, but um, let's say you were uh, you know, a member of the next generation and you had a choice of, let's say, you know, going to school and majoring in computer science and starting up some kind of, you know, um, oh, you know, one of those little companies and making a lot of money, or you had a choice of going to Hollywood and becoming a movie star, or you had a choice of being a farmer. Why would you choose to be the farmer? And I'm asking that with prejudice as a city person. <laughs> okay, so I think the question yeah. is, why, why? why, you know, with all of the choices in the world and all of the hard jobs you just spent 20 minutes talking about, why would you choose to be a farmer? And I'm gonna add both for the next generation and for you all personally. Why do you make that choice and stay with it? I think that, especially not coming from any type of agriculture background, I grew up in a completely different world. And for me, um, I just fell in love with, with everything about agriculture. I fell in love with the fact that it's always changing and I am always going to be investing in something for my future and something for my children's future. And that's why I continue to stay in farming and agriculture is that I, I'm truly invested and I'm not invested in the fact of my children have to become farmers. I'm invested in the sustainability of land and being able to give that land to them or to give it to someone that, that will be just as invested in it as I am. But also too, when it comes to preparing for the next generation, it isn't always about preparing a farmer. Everything we're doing on the farm now is is we're creating contributing members of society. You know, our, my little children, they have little chores that they do and the work ethic, like we're just trying to instill those good values that every parent tries to instill, except we're doing it on the farm. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I want to talk to this from the aspect of a person who has a 36 year old son who is taking over our farm. And um, it was very interesting because from the time that he was two years old, you could tell that he wanted to farm. And he's very intelligent. My mother-in-law used to say, well, you know, this is just wrong. Blaine is too smart to farm. She was from that generation where you still had, you know, either it was the oldest child or the child who couldn't go away because he wasn't smart enough to get those jobs you're talking about. So he had to be the one that stayed behind and farmed. But with the technology, the financing, and everything that's happened over the last 40, 50 years, you need someone who is going to be very intelligent. And as they've said before, you know, they're handling marketing. Marketing is a terribly involved and difficult job to do on a farm when the markets move the way they do nowadays. Um, they have to do the finances. My son is able to go in and figure out, okay, this loan for how many years at which percent would be better than that loan at, you know. So he's constantly working out the different finance options of things. And, but he loves farming. And, and it's always been in his mind to be in agriculture, but to be the owner. So I think that's maybe where the difference is, you know, you can build things or you can go work for a finance company and make, you know, which is not easy money, but it's guaranteed money, right? When you have a job that pays you X number of dollars a year and this is your job. Farming is not nearly that simple, but it's exciting. 
It's challenging every day of your life and you are the owner. You are the one that is making decisions and if they go good or bad, you see what's happening and you have that ownership over that. And I don't think I've Come ever met a farmer that doesn't love his job. Love it. Love or love, love her job. They they get to do their hobby every day. Yeah. Little boys that play with trucks and tractors, they grow up to play with bigger trucks and tractors. Coming from a teaching background, um, I always had a side of me that wanted to be an entrepreneur and I always wanted to go back to the farm. But what my dad had said is get a degree in something so you have something to fall back on if this goes south. And it, it never has, but it, it's a passion. I can't even explain it. It is, it is a desire that pulls you home and it's a passion. It, when they say it gets in your blood, it really, really does. I can't imagine living or working anywhere else. And even on the roughest days where machinery has broke down, you've been stuck a hundred times, <laughs> um, animals that may have died that you worked hour, hours and hours on and tirelessly to try to, to take care of whatever issue they may have had and it, it just didn't work out in the end. At the end of the day, when you lay your head down and it may have been the first chance you had to sleep in 24 hours, you just, it's just this calming effect because you know that what you're doing is making a difference and that you just you are where you belong you're at home and i think a lot of times even people who have office jobs or work in hollywood they do it for the same reasons you know that's what their passion is that's if you're not doing what makes you happy you should be looking for a career elsewhere mm -hmm. and every morning i wake up just grateful that i've had this opportunity and grateful that I did decide to come back to the farm. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question right in the front. Um, yeah, I uh, grew up in a farming community as well, Stockton, California, Central Valley. Um, and what we've seen a lot in that area is that uh, there's a sort of a change in what's being planted. So now, um, because we're so close to to Napa and Sonoma, um, and we always grew grapes in the area, but now what you see is vineyards everywhere. And my mom made a comment the other day that, yeah, we're all gonna be able to drink wine and that'll be great, but there won't be any food to eat. Um, so I'm wondering, just asking you all, do you see a tension in that? Because obviously they're growing grapes because it's very profitable for them, but um, is that to the detriment of something else, or is that, or do you see that there's just a lot of room in the market for changes? I think I th they're making the best business decision for themselves. Yes. And like, um, I believe you might have said, um, you know, we are a family farm, but we're also a business too. And they they might be a family farm, but they are definitely they're looking at the land around them, the market around them, and they're investing in that with those grapes. I think the key to those kinds of things is the market. Um, in northern Minnesota, years ago, there were a lot of dairy farms, and I grew up on one. As that dairy farm market changed, as shipping changed, and we had to move our milk farther away, we could not afford to stay in dairy. And so that's when we changed to beef. We chose to change to beef cattle and make our entire dairy operation into a rotational grazing operation. And what that means is the cattle essentially mob graze or intensive graze in pastures uh, three days at a time and then move through this 3,000 acre area. Um, other farms around us chose to go to corn and soybeans because that made sense for their business decision. So I think it boils down to that. It boils down to every farmer's business decision. Um, do I see that being a problem with food? No, I don't. I think that the farmers are producing more food than we ever have with less inputs um, and with less people farming. And, and we're able to do that because of science and technology. The, the technology behind farming is, is so amazing now where we can grow crops where not only where crops didn't grow before, but it, it's a better crop. And so we, we're able to get um, more food off the same amount of land. And so to watch some of that happen has been just, even in my lifetime, has been almost breathtaking because um, although the market does change and people decide to farm other things, whether it be, I will say in North Dakota, we don't have a lot of vineyards. 
Um, but there are some people who are, who are doing some of those niche markets and different things, and if that works for them, that's great. We do have some vineyards in South Dakota, actually. And in North Dakota. Yes, yeah, there are some. Yeah. <laughs> there are. And Not like California, in every though. state. So. Yes. <laughs> and there, but there are just some differences, and, and you'll notice um, I know we notice on our farm, you'll notice the demand changes and different things like that. And so the market naturally shifts back. No matter how uh, some of those decisions play into it, there's always that natural, you know, it's like a pendulum. It'll come back center again. You never know, in 10 or 15 years, you might see corn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So some of those technological changes you mentioned, I mean, you've talked about changes in seed technology and GPS, and what do you think is the, the technology that has changed more, or did I leave one out? <laughs> well, on. I always say the technology that has been the best for me was the um, lithium battery and the cordless impact wrench. Because prior to that, I, I was out there <laughs> with the haybine, and if, Inevitably, the guys would put this hay bind together, and a, and a hay bind is what cuts our, our hay product. And it has all of these rotating kind of slinging knives, and they break when they hit rocks. And so I would be in the tractor, and I would hit a rock, and you'd have to change a knife. And to change that knife, you'd have to get a socket set and a ratchet, and I would always have to carry a breaker bar. So I'd put that on the ratchet and then try to break that nut loose. Um, with the lithium batteries and the cordless impact wrench, I am no longer standing on a breaker bar in the middle of the field, jumping up and down on it, trying to get it loose. So that's a, you know, a small technology. Yeah, we that might I be using satellite, but the tool investment. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that every time I'm cutting hay. Great. Are there any other questions in the audience? Yes, at that table in, in the middle. Very interesting discussion, thank you all. I originally uh, grew up on a farm in southwest Minnesota, but I've been away for a long time and now live here in DC as a uh, environmental scientist focusing on soil. So I'm very interested in uh, what you are doing to increase the soil health. You know, so for many years, there were a lot of chemical inputs that were going in and er eroding the soil, um, decreasing the soil health. What are you doing to, to um, increase your soil health? So the question is about soil and soil health and what you put in the soil or what changes you've made to increase the health and production be, of your soil. I'll be really quick, as a rotational, as a rotational cattle grazer, um, we are focused on soil health. Uh, we, we think that that is our biggest um, benefit, is that when we have healthy soil. And so when we made that transition from crops to rotational grazing, we went in, we put native grasses in, we put pollinator plots in. Uh, yearly soil samples are taken um, our goal is to increase organic matter in the soil, and so our cattle move across the entire farm, uh, both in the summer and in the winter, just so we can spread out that, um, that manure. So we're using that as fertilizer um, and really focusing on native plants, um, both grasses and forbs, that we use for our feed. And um, we find that that really helps increase the soil um, the, like I said, the organic matter, we get better water retention, all of those things yeah. with our cattle. On our farm, we use an agronomist. Um, we, do we don't have the science knowledge, the science background, uh, but we understand. It's kind of like, you know, an NBA player and an NFL player, they've got the shoes, <laughs> the pads, the equipment that they need. Having healthy soil is just as important as our equipment. Oh, there we go. And so um, we have an agronomist that comes and does soil testing to check and see where our organic matter is at, what our levels are at, and makes recommendations to us uh, regarding what we may need to, whether we need to look at adding a fertilizer. And since we have cattle, we have our own fertilizer for the most part. Um, or if there's something else that our soil is, is lacking, if there's a recommendation as far as what our crop rotation should be so that we can naturally put um, some of those nutrients back into the soil or you know whatever else it may be. Uh, it's kind of like our agronomist is just as important to the farm as having a pediatrician for my children. You know, he's the one that writes that prescription that makes our soil healthier. 
And an agronomist is an ag scientist? It's basically an agriculture scientist who, who has the background and, and the knowledge to be able to look at those. They actually take samples um, in various areas in our field. Uh, they take a probe on a pickup and they go down and they drill a little bit of the soil out so that they're able to test it to see exactly what the nutrient base is in the, in the soil. Um, it's kind of like having a blood test done at your doctor's office, except for for our fields. Yeah, and Vanessa, what are you going to add? We have been, over the, over the last four decades, there's been a lot of changes. There's been changes in not only the seed technology, chemical technology, and also the machinery technology. And so we have been able to go from where we've had to dig a lot of our fields to kill weeds, other, you know, and cut back on the use of chemicals, um, to where we're doing more of a, an either minimal till or no till. And that has been achieved by the fact that we have had um, genetically engineered crops that can take um, less chemical and you can get rid of all of the weeds at one time and then go in and, you know, and plant your seeds and have a much easier way of not having to go in and just dig and dig and dig and dig to kill some of the weeds. Um, we have had some very tough fields in the past that what once our crop, especially if our soybean crop was up, say this high um, or even lower, if you sprayed the wrong chemical on that, you're going to kill that and you still were having a hard time um, controlling some of the edge of the field weeds. So now we've gotten those weeds cleaned up um, over, the, over the last 10, 20 years. And so we're able to do a little switching around as far as um, a lot of what we do is economically based. You know, so when we go in and spread fertilizer, we do the same thing. We do soil testing. If we want 150 bushel corn or if we want 200 bushel corn, this is how much of each fertilizer that you put on this field. Um, and that goes, that prescription goes from field to field, um, depending on what crop you're putting on, depending on what that, that dirt is like um, already. And so we try to get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the trash is what we call it. It's the old plants from last year, but we try to just basically leave it in the field so it decays and adds um, organic matter to the dirt. When we've had sugar beets, and then after, when you harvest sugar beets, you've got just black land. There is nothing out there. And so we have in the past also planted a, um, like radishes, turnips, and other greens that you go out there and plant. That keeps that land from blowing over the winter and, for, and also adds then that organic matter in. So there have been a lot of developments over the last few years, especially of ground cover crops, making sure you've got the the right, uh, you know, and enough nutrients that you're putting in. But, you know, we don't want to put in a thousand dollars worth of nitrogen onto our land when we only would need, say, four hundred dollars worth of nitrogen because the rest of it's just going to go away. So we make our decisions very much based on what our field can use, what our plants can use up, and what's not going to leach away because that's no good for us. It's just money down the drain, literally. And so we very much are very prescriptive about the chemicals, the fertilizers, anything that we're putting onto our ground. Any other questions from the audience? I think we have one right over here. Hi. Um, so recently there's been a huge trend in non-GMOs. I'm wondering if that's affected any of your processes or changed your business trends or any of your projections with what you do. So I think the question is about the um, response to GMOs from a consumer perspective. There's been a lot of information in the news about GMO labeling, including um, government bills around that and being passed at the state and national level. How is that um, response from the public and response from researchers impacting your decisions? And have you made any changes? As a producer, as a consumer, I, I'm very supportive of GMOs. And I think that's mainly because I've taken the time to really read about what that can do. And what a GMO is, it's essentially taking a gene from one crop and it might be putting it into another crop to develop those traits, things against um, humidity, 
things against certain pests or certain pests in the field, like she was talking about the worms. Um, but I think that what I foresee is that another trend is also the price in the grocery store is constantly going up. And um, I, I get a lot of questions about that. And if I, see, if, if I see GMO labeling happening in my future, I think that it's just going to increase those costs for you in the grocery store. And I think as consumers, you're gonna have to weigh out your options. Do you wanna pay more or do you really want that label? When in all actuality, it's just about making the best choice for you. And it's about, you know, if you think you want to know if it's non-GMO or GMO, you just have to do the research. There's only a handful of actual crops that are genetically modified. And the genetics that are changed are very specific and very proven, very tested. Um, There's a huge process, at least yeah. what, 15 to 20 years before a trait is approved. And so they're very, when they're tested, they're tested for allergenicity. They're tested for anything that would be toxic. They are tested for all of these things before they're ever allowed to be planted. They're tested by three different government agencies along with the seed companies or the chemical companies. So they have been proven to be um, very safe. And back when I, like I said, when I was farming, I had to put this toxic chemical on top of the seed rather than having something within the seed that does the defense itself. Um, so that has helped out a lot as far as what we're putting into the ground. I'm no longer putting that toxic te chemical into the ground, which helps me personally and helps um, the flora, fauna, everything around us. Like on our operation, um, she's selling a lot of her corn. Um, we raise beef cattle, so a lot of the corn that we grow, we're feeding to our cattle. So for us, it's about having a, a good nutritious product to give to our cattle. So a lot of our corn doesn't actually get sold. And you also have to, to remember too, uh, a lot of times there's a misconception about companies are determining what it is we plant on the farm. And that decision is actually made farm by farm. You know, um, nobody, there isn't a company that and tells me what field. to plant. There isn't a company that tells me uh, which crop or which, uh, you know, which variety of that crop. There are so many, it's kind of like planting a strawberry in a garden. You can plant like an ever-bearing strawberry or you can plant the big, gigantic, ginormous strawberries or, you know, it's not just a strawberry. You have a whole lot of decisions to make. And the same thing goes with farming. Like when we plant a wheat crop, there's not a GMO wheat. And so our wheat crop, though, we decide what variety we want to plant. So whether, you know, it ripens in a shorter amount of time or if it tends to be uh, more drought resistant, if it looks like our weather pattern is changing. Um, you know, it's all kind of, there's so many your factors. Farms. Right? Yeah, the factors you look at your farm and you see decision. what fits for what you're growing. And so those decisions are made year by year. So whether or not we can respond to a market change um, based on, you know, what's being sold at the grocery store, where the prices are at and things like that. But that decision is, is ultimately up to each farmer to, to make themselves. And I would take it one step farther. <laughs> it is also field by field. This year we have three different types of soybeans that we are raising as far as one is resistant to Liberty Chemical, one is resistant to um, Roundup, and the other is a non-GMO. So we've got those three different um, types of fields that we have to very carefully monitor so that we're using the right chemical in each field. Um, and then when we're storing them, they have to be stored separately also so that we know where everything is, especially if we're going from a GM to non-GM. And the one thing that I want to make one simple point about is that GMO or genetically engineered is not an ingredient. It's a process of breeding. Just like we've been breeding things for ever since, you know, the Indians had maize that did not produce very well. And so over the years, through different types of breeding, you know, we now have corn that in some areas of, this, of the United States is like 300 bushels to the acre. And that's through breeding. And genetic engineer is simply a matter of breeding. They have, we now know where every gene is or every genome, we've, tr we've tracked the genomes on corn and on soybeans. And so we can find that very one spot to affect 
so that you know we can have something happen, whether it would be like drought tolerance, so we wouldn't have to have as much water put on a crop. You know, all of these things are very scientific and very technological, but it's a simple matter of breeding. It isn't an ingredient. But it sounds like a lot of the decisions you're making around GMOs are based on business from your perspective. So I'm wondering where the, um, there, people are talking about it more in the consumer marketplace. And is there anything, you know, what do you see as your, your role in that, or at a certain, kind of at the end of the day, that's up to the consumer and you guys are making business right. decisions. I How think, does that work I think we're doing I, it right I, now. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, farmers have to base, we have to base our decision on our economics. Um, Morgan and I were talking earlier, she feeds her cattle uh, corn that they grow because they can grow good corn there. I'm 50 miles off the Canadian border in northern Minnesota. I am never going to get decent corn. So my cattle have to be fed differently. Mine are fed on a barley-based ration when I take them to the finish or when I, when I you know, want to get that, those steers ready for market. Um, prior to that, they're fed hay or they're on pasture. Um, it's not because I think my method is better than anyone else's. It's the economic decision that works the best for my farm. And I have people that come to me and say, um, I, I do 30 to 40 finished cattle a year, just custom finish for people, and it's all word of mouth. And they come and they say, oh, this is grass fed, and, and it is, but it's not because I'm against corn or anything like that, it's because that's what's economically feasible for me. Um, and that's what I can grow. I can grow barley, so I finish those on barley and a grass-based diet. And I think even as a farmer, when I go to the grocery store, I, and especially as a mom, you know, I, you always, you want to provide the best that you can for your children. And I am supportive of GMOs, but that doesn't mean that I don't go to the grocery store and buy organic if it's on sale. I am a supporter of all aspects of the industry. Absolutely. And I think what is important to me, and I'm, you know, of course, on the more emotional side, my husband is going to make those big, strong decisions of the business impacting, but I'm thinking from an emotional standpoint too, like I want to support every aspect of our industry because we're all important. Organic farmers, conventional farmers, whether you use antibiotics or hormones or whether you finish on grass or finish on corn, yep. it's all about a choice. And for me, I prefer corn finished beef over grass finished beef. Mm -hmm. But I also think that if it's confusing for me going to the grocery store mm -hmm. and seeing all those labels, then it has to be even 10 times more confusing for a person that's not coming from any type of ag or farming background. And I think it's all about taking the time to do what you're all doing right now. You're sitting down just listening to us talk about what we're doing on our farm and you're asking those questions. And I think that's the most important thing that as farmers, what we're doing is making ourselves available, whether it's on social media or whether it's sitting on a panel like this, making ourselves available to people that have the questions and are looking for answers. Um, and in fact, Vanessa has a button on that says, ask me, I'm a farmer. Um, so, and like most topics throughout American history, it sounds like there's a lot of complexity here with agriculture and decisions and economics. Um, and thank you to our panel for rounding that up so well for us and giving us a lot of things to think about. Um, thank you to our audience and we'll be available right after the panel to answer any more questions. And um, we hope to, you enjoy the rest of your visit to the museum. Thank you.